All right. Um, yes. Yeah, so totally different questions. So, <laughs> so how did you get? How did you first find out about altered carbon and like be like, this is what? I, uh, I was do. reading. No. <laughs> I was <Fair>. reading, and <laughs> I, actually, I was in I was in Book People, which is I think outside of Powell's, the largest independent bookstore in the United States in Austin, Texas, and they have like the same place I found Name of the Wind. Um, they, which I'm not attached to, but I'm just saying like all the really yeah. <laughs> like, You walk in and they have all the um, all the the staff picks mm -hmm. and tragically also the first place I read Twilight, which is oh, a sad yeah. Yeah, I know. Um, but, uh, <laughs> but I walked in and they had like that that was it was up with all the yeah. staff books picks and all their because they do handwritten cards, yeah. like, what's cool and why. And um, I just thought this was before he'd written the sequels and I thought, oh, this sounds so interesting and then I read it, I fell in love with it, and it was already at Warner Brothers. Joel Silver had already optioned it, but then, um, but then they tried to, then they tried to make it as a PG-13 movie, which the source material is not. Yes, yeah, thank you. <laughs> source material is not. What's interesting about the story is not suited to that approach. So you know that was their kind of mandate in the studio configuration at that time. So ultimately, it went through a couple of rounds there of development, and then the rights reverted to Richard, and at that point, um, I called him with a couple of um, partners that I was working with at that time, uh, Brad Fisher and um, Jamie Vanderbilt, and um, I just pitched him what I would do with it, which was, in essence, hard R, like unapologetic hard R, write it as a spec for a feature, here are all the things I would keep, which is almost everything, here's the stuff I would, because I mean, at one point there was a discussion I heard about it. I heard about a discussion of like, well, we don't want them to be snuff whores. It would be better if they were lap dancers. And I was just like, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't know how to. I don't know how to get the um, the meaningful moral conversation out of lap dancers <laughs> in the same way. They don't happen. It's just not the same. Um, so I, I ended up talking to Richard, and I, I said, this is what I would do with it. This is where I would sort of condense it. This is what I would add. Um, and I also told him that it would take a long time and that I had a day job and that I was going to be writing this as a spec and then I, I was very clear and I thought he was going to say no because I was so clear with him that I, it was going to be a thing that was going to take a lot of time and that was about eight years ago and um, he said yes he told me later precisely because I didn't say this is the most important thing that I have and it's up first and I'm going to throw everything else out of the way and I was like yeah I'm the sole breadwinner I got to feed my family and I really want to do this but it's going to be a thing that I have to do over time um, so he said it actually sounded genuine which it was and that's how it ended up happening and then I wrote a draft several drafts uh, as a feature and at that point you know and I was looking for a director and it was such a dense piece of work and and this is kind of a combination of the ascendancy of Marvel and uh, in movies right. and the kind of rise of peak TV, certain kinds of movies became harder and harder and harder to get made. Certainly an R-rated science fiction piece along like the, you could make Blade Runner at one point. Now you can make the sequel to Blade Runner, but it's harder to make Blade Runner. Mm -hmm. So it became more and more obvious that if you were able to use the, the sort of conceptual framework of the book which is that each one of those books, Kovach looks like a different person right. because it's in a different sleeve, that you could easily um, um, make that sort of adaptable to a television framework where it's the same character and a different actor every year um, or every two years, depending on how long it takes us to do this. But that was where it came from. And then I went to Skydance with it. We talked about doing it as a movie, and um, they had the same trepidations about selling marketing an R-rated film that has no branding. I mean, Tim did a beautiful job with Deadpool, just beautiful. But part of what worked about Deadpool was it was branded, right? Um, and original also, IPs are just hard. Original IP is very hard now, and it, and it's more successful on television. Mm -hmm. People really are much more receptive to taking that risk on TV, um, and for better or worse, and I think this is a good thing. Television also provides something that that you know was so native to the great noir movies of the 40s and 50s, the great like Raging Bull movies of the 70s, which is this real emphasis on character. Even though we have like a cool street and we've got some great effects work and all that other stuff, it's the character that you can develop over 10 hours as opposed to over two hours. That is, it's a different ball of wax and not something that you see in movies as much. Certainly not at an R-rated level with science fiction. Right. So that was that. That's how that happened. Yes. Is it fair to say that the the first season is the first book, and if you're new, it's going to be the second book? The, the first season is the first book. Right. 
The second season is whatever Richard and I decided is, <laughs> because we have both decided that since I created some collapsing in the first book and made Cal Chris Falconer a contemporary of Kovach, that instead of someone who had died many years before, mm -hmm. in the books she doesn't show up until the third book. In our story, she shows up from the beginning, and they have a backstory together. So that changes everything that would happen in the second season. Whether it would be an archaeological dig like it is in the book, and, and, and all the corporate espionage that happens in the second book, maybe. But, but honestly, the way I look at Kovach and the way I look at this universe is everything that I love about the show was a collaboration between me and him. So that's, that is the well that I would go back to to figure out what the second story would be. Because a lot of the stuff that we created for this just doesn't really fit right. um, in, that, in that second book. And how much of, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> when you say it was a collaboration, we... How is it that you two spoke and then you just told the third person? <laughs> wasn't even you. No, let's, let's start with you. No, you jumped in. You did it, you did it. I, I, I applaud, I applaud your initiative. Go, go. When you say it was a collaboration, I mean, um, at what stage did that happen? Oh, from the beginning. Right. I'm like, I'm going to do this. How do you feel about it? Yeah. Oh, what about this or what about this? Oh, that'd be nice. I mean, it's not... It, 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 he was very respectful of my process, but he read the drafts, had an opinion, right. pushed me when he... You know, and there were places where he and I disagreed, but pla and he was always incredibly gracious about them, but places where he definitely created, you know, a, um, a way for me to look at things I've written myself into cul-de-sacs where he showed me a way that we could look at it. Because the whole universe exists in one way in my head and another way in his. And it's when you put those two together that you get something you know, really amazing on screen. Mm. But, the books are, but the books are brilliant. I mean, he's a brilliant writer. Uh, Richard is still implicated uh, very much in the process uh, during the filming, during the production? He's been here. I would like it if he was here more. But he has a whole life and some <laughs> other stuff that he does yeah. out there in Scotland. So we get him here from time to time. I, I fully admit that if if we could have him here way more, I'd be thrilled. But, you know, there's a whole the kid, the wife, yeah. the job. Life. Uh, yeah. yeah. What's he, that? <laughs> yes. He was on set one day. Oh, he was on set quite a bit. He was on set for a week. What was month. his his reaction? I mean... He wrote a blog oh. post about it, actually. Um, if you go on his website, um, he wrote a blog post about it. I don't it. think he published it. He did it? No, he's, he held Why it back. not? He held it back. It's so good. He held it back at our request. <laughs> Why did you do that? It was so good. Oh, my God. I know. Oh it was so good, but we have to wait till, till people can go. Okay, well, I can tell you what he, a little bit what he said. Um, uh, he said it was... He said it was a very interesting experience to see the characters that you had created come to life in front of you and talk to the people who were inhabiting them. So you know, he would spend time with Joel, he'd spend time with Marta, um, he'd spend time with Walid, and there was just this, this uh, surreal quality to interacting with the people who were making them alive. And of course, how he saw Kovach, how he saw Riker, is pretty much that guy. And he got to meet, um, he, he got to meet kind of most of the cast and, and a couple of the directors and you know, one of the things he said was I always thought that filmmaking you know I had this idea that it would be a little calmer a little slower <laughs> he's like I totally did not understand before I got there that everyone was just going to be going like this all the time and one night that he was there was a uh, we were trying to dress uh, the Fell Street Station set and we'd had a lot of conversations about you know in the production design team all of us together how much paper, smart paper, not smart paper. And I walked onto the set and I was like, I think we just need to start taking things away. So, and I believe there are some photographs of me, if I'm not mistaken, um, where everybody else was working and it was getting close to, um, like you start paying OT beyond a certain point, obviously, and, and everyone's exhausted anyway. So I was not gonna ask props and set deck to stay there in the middle. It was like two in the morning by the time I was finished. So I, I mean, I got on there with the projectionist, Gladys, um, and we were kind of looking at the stuff on the walls and thinking, well, we could do projections here and make it look more interesting. And have you have you been to that set yet, the Fell Street, the inside, not the outside? No. It's like a big, no. it's a it's a sort of church that's been repurposed. No, we're no, not. Oh, no, we're gonna get the Are they going to see it? No. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, basically, the thing that's cool about it, among other things, is is while everyone was rehearsing and we were filming some stuff in one part of it, I was able to just sort of, I just took everything off of everything and stuck it on the floor and then started putting things back because sometimes you can't tell until right. all the set deck is off. And at first, the crew just kind of watched like I was high. And then and what was nice was after about like 15 minutes, they all just started helping me. 
Um, and Richard was watching. He was like, is this, is this what you're supposed to I'm like, this is really not what I'm supposed to do. <laughs> but it is the spirit of this show, which is that nobody is surprised that the showrunner is going to, because we're world creating, right? And I'm going to say, at one point, I'm just going to say, well, this doesn't look right on this desk. Let's take this off and put that over there. And, and they were so receptive because it's also, I mean, this is an amazing crew. This is a phenomenal crew. But that, that was Richard's takeaway was like, I just, she just didn't stop. I just kept waiting <laughs> for her to stop. And I, I didn't, I had one dinner with him while he was here, which was way not enough. Um, but we did end up with Fell Street Station looking awesome. Amazing. It looks amazing. Yeah. But, you know, a lot of that was just when you're trying to build a world, you do find yourself at the last minute saying, oh my God, no, 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 no. Take it away, put it over here. Mm -hmm. Redo this, put this up there. We came up with some brilliant stuff, but it was totally last minute. I mean, I hope. <laughs> I like the way it looks. I so hope. I've got like a two-prong question here, which is, so the book was written in 2002, right? Yes. Yeah, so it's been yes, 15 it years. The world has changed significantly. Right. Radically. And there's a lot of um, shows and film right now that are actually dealing with what is it like to be a person. Like it's a very... What does um, it mean to be human? Yeah, what does it mean to be human? Westworld is doing it. Um, different movies are doing it to different degrees of um, success, like Ghost in the Shell, maybe not so much, but you're doing something similar here where you can take a person and put them into a different gender, different um, yeah. ethnicity, yeah. and is, I guess seeing, I'm just asking, and also the sexualization of violence towards women specifically um, in the novel where like there are, any, there are no male prostitutes in this universe, apparently, <laughs> but like in the book. There are in our show. Yeah, that's what I was gonna ask. Yeah. They're all over the damn place. Yeah, that's, what I was, that's where it was going with both the prongs are coming back around and like, how do you modernize that so that you are cognizant of like. Wait, where's, where's Benji? Oh, hold on. <laughs> Benji! <laughs> that might work, sometimes that works. Uh, let me see if I, it literally might work. Uh, shit. Somebody, somebody text him. Oh, right. Text him to bring me my phones. Yeah, my all your phones. <laughs> no, uh, this is a visual thing. Okay. Uh, no, there was actually one point where we're shooting the strip joint in the pilot. It... Damn, Just go on, is... tell us everything. Well, I can't. No, this is an off the record part. Shit. <laughs> I can tell you half of it. Okay, so here's the half I'll tell you. <laughs> so we're shooting the strip joint in the pilot, and Marta, Higuereta, and I, and Joel are all looking at the prostitutes, the three of us. And we all look at each other, we're like, there's no guy strippers. Why are there no guy strippers? The three of us. And Joel's like, yeah, I feel like we uh, need some guy strippers. And uh, you know, Martin and I are like, totally need the guy strippers. So <laughs> we sent them off to get us some dudes. <laughs> dudes come back and Martin and I are like, I don't know about that mesh, man. Don't you feel we should just, so we just were like, we'll cut a hole in that. And we'll just, we'll just pull it out, right? Because we really need to see that this is serious because the women are hanging all over the place. Yeah. So I, I can fully say that we are equal opportunity awareness of the tendency of the human body to be exploited and degraded by those in power. Mm. Gender plays a role in our story because I believe personally that we are all smug and crack if we think 365 years from now women are not still going to be the primary focus of exploitation. We are, we are totally smoking crack. But the idea that, and this doesn't go anywhere near the body thing uh, that you were asking about with Westworld, but this is sort of a different thing. Right. The, uh, for lack of a better way to put it, visual politics of the story that we're trying to tell um, is conscious in the sense that there's a, what's the right word? This is gonna sound really like not right for a television interview. I'm really conscious of the intersectionalism of experience, right? That's the great answer, yeah. Okay, well, but, and what that means is the idea that there's, that there's a, this, yeah, my oldest who's 18 and is going to Columbia next year mm -hmm. is gay and like, I mean, the banging over the head that happens with me, where it's like, I didn't, do you know who Power Bottom is? It's like, I had no idea who Power Bottom was until last week. So now, now I'm just like, oh, please stop telling me about this because it's so horrible. Anyway, I'll tell you afterwards, it's really funny. I mean, it's <laughs> awful, but it's really funny. It's like, it, it, it's, this, it's this horrible, horrible story of, of like, of appropriation of queer mm -hmm. identity and, and, uh, um, and sexual assault. Terrible story. Anyway, the point is that, that 
there's a continuum of experience that's involved in these women and men and what happens to them. And the people that we focus on are largely female because we focus on the victimization of specific individuals like Lizzie in the book. Okay, in the book, Lizzie, I don't know if you guys have read the book, but in the book, Lizzie is Elliot's daughter who you never see. Um, in our story, Lizzie is a, a huge character and she's a prostitute who was beaten to death by Miriam. It's kicked to death. She was pregnant with Bancroft's child and she's killed. I've mixed her with another character in the book. And intentionally, we cast her as a woman of color who starts out as being the most broken and most helpless person in the story and becomes by the end of it um, in a very conscious kind of a, I don't know exactly how to play it, very conscious sort of foxy brown kind of thing, which whether that's good or bad, right? And it doesn't matter, it's just like if that was the intent, is that she ends up killing a bunch of meths because unlike Kovach, her experience of the exploitation has been direct and it has been a part of her attempt to save her mother who ended up in jail, her attempt to reach her father who wasn't, who wasn't able to interact with her, her experience is massively different, even though we don't exactly track why it is, and there's a visual iconography to that, whether or not there should be, because of what she looks like, that creates a whole other narrative around her showing up at the end and killing a bunch of people while she is saving her family. And, and I, again, again, this is not in the book, and I'm proud of this. In the book, Kovach fights his way out of Head in the Clouds. In the show, we're telling a slightly different story. So the girl who he helped to save, who has now refound herself, shows up on Head in the Clouds, manages to kill a bunch of people to get him. Ortega comes back for him. And it's those two women who allow him to escape. Otherwise, he'd be dead. And it's... it's if anything, I was trying to create the outlaw Josie Wales story because that, regardless of what you think of the author, that movie has within it, contextually, the idea that we never survive alone. We survive as part of a community, no matter how disparate the community is, and that's what you try and create in the show, which is a disparate community. Anyway, sorry, that's kind of it, but the violence towards women thing, for what it's worth, you can't escape it as part of this world because the plot is, um, that Bancroft himself beats girls who look like his wife to death, sometimes com completely to death, sometimes almost to death. When it's completely to death, he's very careful not to destroy their stacks, and then he replaces their sleeves, and he sees that as moral, which, of course, it's not. Um, but he thinks it is. And his transgression is that he actually real deaths one of those girls, actually really can't get her back. And, of course, that for him is, that for him is an unimaginable thing. So he kills himself so he doesn't deal with the memory of it. But that doesn't change, and that's the intersection for me in that particular place, it doesn't change right, what he did. In his mind, it makes it better because he punished the killer right. by eradicating the killer, but that's all about him, right? It's not, not about even, her. Not about her. It's like she's still just this thing out there that he acted upon. So we try very hard, I am trying very hard, to create um, this spectrum of female identity, which science fiction oftentimes does not do, um, oh, Benjamin Sean, thank you. Okay, no, this is super important. Um, so that we have both the most heroic and the most villainous characters in this show are the women, um, on purpose. Yeah. Um, the people who do the killing and the people who get killed. Um, uh, what are you gonna show them? <laughs> don't she's tell like, her. don't. No, no, no. I'm, I'm, no, I'm just saying. You know, on occasion, we do completely unofficial costume fittings for male prostitutes. <laughs> um, and on occasion, when we do them, uh, I say, oh, you know, we're kind of like doing a little thing with, I'm just seeing if it's going to pull up or not. Just like doing a little thing with a male prostitute kind of thing, you know. Oh, look at that. Um, so I just think yeah, it might be worth mentioning that we did, because it's visual proof. <laughs> uh, I'm not making this shit up, but also, you know, when you start when you start to get into the conversation about, and it, I love Westworld, and they are they are like Lisa and Jonah are such inspirations to me, truly, um, and I I think that so much of what they show is a they're they're trying they're making a point, 
Right. And the, and the point is a good one and one that I really, really agree with. And we're just in a slightly different position yeah. of what we are dealing with. Yeah. I don't know if I can find them or not. They're right, fairly oh, shocks. I hate to interrupt, but Shut we have about five minutes left. So yeah, somebody asked me something. You mentioned, um, you, you mentioned in passing how kind of absurd the idea of a PG-13 version of this is. Well, and it's just not this. Yeah. And I the book is, is the book is very kind of hard edged in its very. depiction of violence and sexuality and very. the language as well. Yep. How much of you of that are you able to retain in this your version? Pretty much all of it, except I, as I was saying earlier to um, the folks before you, it did not occur to me at the time, even though it exists in the book, uh, to to go full on Brian Fuller and show an erect penis. I didn't go there because um, <laughs> honestly, it hadn't just hadn't crossed my mind. I mean, it's like honest. I really think that's it. It's just like if I thought of it, um, because those are in the book. But uh, in terms of no, we pretty much no. I mean, there's not anything that we didn't do. The one thing that I think we didn't do and I consciously didn't do it is um, and this was this was just me it was my decision um, it was really important not to have Kovach be sleeved or be in virtual in a female body when he's tortured because that visually oh is no uh, it doesn't work it works fine in a novel because in the novel you're you're in the head of the individual right mm -hmm. so you're 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 in Kovach's head, you know where you are. As soon as you switch the actor, you're not in Kovach's head, you're in the face of the female, and that, that you can't get across what works in the book, it'll, it'll never translate. So um, I needed to get the emotion of him being tortured over and over again, and then coming up off the table and killing a whole bunch of people. So I guess you could say that the violence against men in this uh, show is quite extreme. Um, because I did, you know, we cut off his legs and we burned him alive and we, uh, we uh, put worms in his eyes and I'm trying to remember everything we did. I mean, the, oh the torture got really <laughs> nasty. Um, and, but we, it would not have worked to do it. It would not have worked emotionally to do what was done in the book because I need the guy who comes off the table to be the same person who was tortured and for you to identify with the two of them as being one person and you can't, human beings aren't wired that way. We yeah. don't do it if it's a different face. So, so you know, for better or worse. You were talking about intersectionality earlier, mm. which bless you. Um, so <laughs> talk about the intersectionality with, or intersectionality with dealing with sexualization and violence against women. How are you dealing with, I guess, um, is, are we a post-racial society 375 years in the future? Like, how does that work putting like an Asian guy into yeah. a white guy's First body? off, I think, <laughs> no offense, as I have no place to say this, yeah. right? No offense. I think the idea of the post-racial society is um, naive at best. So maybe it'll happen. Anything's possible. My experience of human beings has been that they don't roll that way. Um, I wish I was wrong. And I would love to be wrong. Um, so I think maybe the best answer for that would be we're playing into the, under, the expectation of a multiracial society. We are playing into a global society. There is an assumption that tribalism will continue. There is an assumption in costume, there's an assumption in language. I mean, as I was saying before, I mean, I think we, we don't, we subtitle, but we have people understand each other. So within the context of the show, uh, we speak Vietnamese, Russian, um, uh, a whole bunch of Spanish, um, Arabic, uh, and Japanese that I can remember. There might be more than that. Um, and people talk to each other um, in these languages and, and speak back sort of in the Star Wars universe way of like you just assume mm -hmm. that they understand. We subtitle and we assume they understand. But the, the idea that everyone would somehow move to a place of some kind of... Uh, I don't believe in colorblindness. I don't believe in the idea of, you know, of, uh, of some unification. Right. I don't think that that's realistic and I think it feels false um, unless you get into that. Um, Ursula K. Le Guin novel that I can't remember the name of right now. Oh. Everybody turns gray, which was so good. Uh, Do that one next. Say what? Do that one next. Uh, it's already been done. The best it's ever going to be done. Um, <laughs> uh, way back when in the '70s. But um, that's the thing is, I really feel like we are trying to call out the fact that what's interesting is the coexistence and intersection of societies and of lenses of experience. That's interesting. The idea that somehow we're all going to end up with some monolithic experience um, feels false. So we don't do it. Uh, I don't, because I, I don't, I don't, I, th I think, I think you don't buy it emotionally and then it interferes with your experience of the show. So you never, you never, 
You've never been a Trekkie? Well, that's kind of the point. What was great about Trek, original Trek, why is Uhura's name Swahili? Why is the inside of her mm -hmm. quarters all decorated with African art, right? Why do you, why do you see in that show people get along who, who have a comfortable relationship insofar as one could in the 60s, and you know, in a very like, I mean, yes, she had to constantly answer the phone. But my point is like, there was a real respect in there for the idea of, of not abandoning your culture in order to be part of the Federation. And that's absolutely where all this comes from. I mean, that's, that's totally where it started um, when I was a kid. Right. I believe in that. Um, now, I'm gonna show you something funny. This might answer the question. So this, this, <laughs> is, this is different than that. Uh, oh. This is who Cal is in our world. Nice. Um, this is the museum poster for her. And this speaks to a whole lot of things that are happening right now on purpose, right? This is, this is, welcome to a We're terrorist. All under embargo, it's fine. Yes, welcome to, to the terrorist fist bump, right? Mm -hmm. um, that's the thing is we are trying to say something about our perception of what that word means, our perception of what um, the uprising was a revolution that failed. She led the revolution that failed. It matters to me that the, you know, in the most obvious way, that the person who led that revolution was A, female, and B, clearly, you know, clearly not part of the mainstream meth society. So that's pretty much it. Part of my sleeve. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, it was such a pleasure. You're awesome. You said you'd write it.